Are you good? An estuary is uh, an area that has some salt water and some fresh water. I think that's Austin's house. Listen. Who's to say? Where we're getting our water from? Listen. Water? Are you filming? Good deal. All right, my turn. The marshes are estuaries because when it rains, the fresh water comes off of the land and into the marshes. And when it's high tide, the salt water comes up from the oceans and into the marshes. So you have a mixing of fresh water and salt water. Brackish. We call it brackish water. Very good. Do it, Tom. Ten points for the point. No. I'll accept it, Dad. And so you have a very special area that doesn't exist anywhere but on the coast. And the um, the more um, shallow the gradient between the land and the ocean, <coughs> the more shallow, the, the less steep the slope is the greater the width of the marsh. So around here, we have a very shallow slope for our um, continental shelf. It goes real shallow. If you go down to, say, Miami, or you can, especially you can go to a place that has trenches, um, like, uh, like California, and it's very steep, and so you don't have much marsh. Marsh exists in this area that gets flooded by high tide. So if low tide's here, and high tide is here, this is all marsh. And you can have grasses growing, marsh grasses, and uh, you get a lot of, so the high tide is when it gets flooded, and then it goes back to low tide, and then you have creatures living in there and fresh water coming off whenever it rains. And uh, you can have rivers emptying into this area, um, you get a lot of different, uh, you get a lot of different plants and animals that live in this area where it's brackish water. So we call that an estuary. And estuaries aren't common. It feels common because we're right next to one. But in reality, there's very few places where there's estuaries. And estuaries are the um, nursery for lots and lots of animals. Lots of birds lay their eggs in these estuaries. Lots of fish lay their eggs in these estuaries. There are a lot of fish that live in the ocean, and they come into the marshes to lay their eggs and to, and to fertilize the eggs, because most of the fertilization is external. So the females lay their eggs, the males spray their sperm in these estuary areas. And um, the, the eggs uh, turn into larvae, and turn into baby fish in these estuary areas. So they're very important. If you remove the estuaries, the fish don't have a place to lay their eggs, and you, and you lose the fish. And that's why we're seeing the reduction in fish numbers that we've seen in the last hundred years, because the estuaries are disappearing. So we've got to protect the estuaries. And here in Georgia, we have some of the widest marshes in the world because we're such a shallow angle going from high tide to low tide. So we have that shallow angled continental shelf. Whereas most coasts like California, it's very steep. You have very little room for any kind of marsh or anything like that. Isn't that interesting? You live in a special area. Yay, us. Too many nags. Well, yeah, there's a lot of insects live around here. Too many mud. Now, there's other kinds of estuaries other than the kind we have. The, the most common type of estuary is called a drowned river valley. And you can see a river is emptying right here. And where the river meets the ocean, um, it slows down and it becomes wider. And um, the oceans over time go down in level and come up in level. During an ice age, the oceans are way down. And during times when the planet is hot, the oceans are way up. The oceans have come up in recent millennia, 
And one of the things they do when the ocean comes up, it drowns the river valley. The river valley is the area not only where the river was, but also where the river would periodically flood its banks. And it creates a wide area around rivers called the river valley. Y'all ever heard of a river valley before? No. Wherever you see a river, you'll usually see a flat area on either side of the river. They like to put roads and bike paths and stuff on it because it's cool, you ride by the river. But if you build your house there, it's very likely if that river floods, then it'll flood your house. So often you don't see houses built on the in the river valleys. Yes? Question? Why are there so many houses? Well, that's to the side of the river valley. That's actually above. Them. So this is the river valley right here. Okay. And here. Where is that? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. It's Tampa. Yeah, yeah. So um, if, the, if the ocean comes up, it drowns the river valley. You have a, an estuary called a drowned river valley. That's the most common type of estuary, and that's not the kind we have here. Here's some examples. Hudson River, Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, Galveston, Tampa Bay. If you're looking on your computer, it might tell you where that is. Does it tell you where that is? What does it say? It says, it's, oh wait, no, not that one. I this picture? Does it say where that picture is? Yeah, River X, X Ferry, England. England. Oh, it's in England. And Blue Will. Yeah. We have what's called a bar built estuary. It's also called a lagoon type estuary. How did our estuaries form? In the last ice age, when it got warmer, the oceans came up. And the oceans, as they were coming up, pushed a lot of sand with them. And the sand built up and built these islands. And so you have your island, which is, a, is, is, a, is like a big sandbar that's been built up. And behind it, you have your estuary. This is all this marsh is sediment that comes in from the ocean, and the ocean goes around here, and the water slow down. Imagine water coming this way around the island, and this way around the island, the water hits, the, the, the waters hit one another and slow down. And when the waters slow down their movement, they drop, the sand falls out of them. So fast moving water can carry sand. Slow moving water, the sand falls out. So if you got fast moving water carrying sand coming around this way, and fast moving water carrying sand coming around this way, when the waters hit, hit one another, all the sand drops out. That's what forms the marsh behind the islands. So the marsh is a lot of roots. mud behind the islands. What's that? Roots are sand. It's in sand. Like the roots are. Yeah. The roots of all the marsh plants? Yeah. Yeah. The plants can really grow in sand. Um, they have to have really deep roots that spread out, and, and yeah, the sand can't shift around. But, but we have plants that are adapted to, do, to, to be able to handle that. Right. There's only a couple types of plants growing in the marsh. There's not many. They're the only plants that can live in that habitat. And they just grow like crazy. Nothing can stop them. Spartina is one of them. You ever heard of Spartina? Spartans are serious. That's the main, when you look at this marsh grass and you see all this green grass, it's, it's Spartina, almost all of it. It's the only one that can survive the salty conditions. Here's another type of estuary, a fjord type. Can you say fjord? Fjord. fjord. Fjords are carved by glaciers. The movement of huge blocks of ice that slowly move through the rock. And they're so heavy that they scrape out the, the land and form these large openings, these big U-shaped canyons that will fill up with seawater and become a fjord. Valleys formed by glaciers. You see a lot of them in Alaska and Greenland and Iceland and uh, Norway. I think the word fjord comes from Norway. It's a good word. We don't have glacier activity around here. Even during the ice ages, the ice never got this far down. So we never formed glaciers, and we never had glaciers carving 
rock. This didn't happen down here. The farthest south during the Ice Age the ice came was about New York City. The polar caps came all the way down to New York City. When was that? The height of the Ice Age. Um, the, the end of the last Ice Age was about 10,000 years ago. And the height of the last Ice Age was probably 30,000 years ago. So that's when the ice was furthest down. And if you would have gone to New York at that time and been standing there in New York, you'd have been under about a mile of ice. There's also tectonic and tectonically produced estuaries. This is an estuary that forms by movement of the plates. And when you get movement of plates, you can get you can get plates that are coming together. Y'all know when plates come together, they can do that and come down. And um, forcing movement of land down can produce an estuary. And um, that one right there is uh, is an estuary that's caused by movement of tectonic plates and subsidence of land. Subsidence means sinking. Can you say subsidence? Substance. All at the same time? Substance. That means sinking of land. <coughs> what were we going to say? I said it's really deep because like, the place. Yeah, it can get deep right there. Right, right off the edge, there's this huge trench. And so you're kind of having a little extension of the mm -hmm. trench into there. Alcatraz is in there somewhere. Right there, maybe? Right there? Y'all heard of Alcatraz? Prison? Yeah. Island prison? Then somebody escaped from it, and they're like, oh, this, this, this doesn't even work. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't know if they survived the... Yeah, they don't know. It's a mystery. It's a great movie about that. Escape from Alcatraz. Clint Eastwood, one of the best actors of my generation. He's still and directors now. Yeah, he's good. You need to know in an estuary there's a thing called a salt wedge. A salt wedge is the fact that seawater is heavier than fresh water. So if you got a fresh water coming this way, and you got salt water coming in from the ocean, there's an area that's like a wedge with salt water on the bottom and fresher water on the top. And this is really cool because there are certain fish and certain uh, brackish water species like crabs that require certain salinities. So let's imagine a crab requires 10 parts per thousand salinity. That's right here in this little wedge right here. So you could find a crab living right here in this little wedge just hanging out at 10 parts per thousand. And it couldn't go up here and it couldn't go down here. It's stuck there in its little wedge. But the cool thing about these salt wedges is they move as the tide goes in and out. So as the tide goes out, the salt water will retreat, and the river will push forward, and this wedge might increase in size or move outward, and the crab has to move along and stay at the right salinity. Wouldn't that be an interesting line? You couldn't just hang out and do nothing. You have to move where the salt is correct, or you just die. Have you any good board? Yeah, that's right. Don't get bored. You do that all day long. Go back and forth. Every tide will change. Isn't that a different life? Salt wedge. What about the marsh sediment? The mud that forms in the marsh, remember, it was suspended by the water and carried by the moving currents. Mud that's carried by moving water is usually pretty tiny grains. Little tiny grains. <coughs> and when it falls out of the water, when the water's slow behind the islands, it falls out. Those little tiny grains are tiny and they form the mud of the marsh. That mud is really thick with tiny grains. It almost looks like ink. <coughs> If you grab some of it, you could wipe it on your face. It'll be like you're painting your face. The, the, the grains are so tiny. And sometimes I'll do that to, to scare my enemies. And I come rising out of the marsh, and they're like, oh my gosh, this guy's 
Anyway, that marsh mud is really fine grain. And what happens when it settles on the bottom, it's so, the grains are so small that they can form an impenetrable barrier to oxygen. And oxygen can't get through the mud. So if you're a plant and you're trying to live in the marsh, your roots are growing down into the mud, but those roots can't get oxygen. That's a huge problem for plants. The roots need oxygen. The leaves don't. The leaves make oxygen through photosynthesis. But the roots need oxygen. Normally, in normal dirt, oxygen can get through normal dirt because there's little spaces. But marsh mud has no spaces between the grains. Oxygen can't get through. So the mud of a marsh is very anoxic. Anoxic means no oxygen or very little oxygen. Can you say anoxic? Anoxic. Anoxic. And so what what do the organisms what do the plants do to survive? They they've come up with a way. They've evolved snorkels. That one have two. And if you ever look at marsh grass, especially the kinds that's washed up on the beach, you can pick it up, all the leaves have fallen off, and you're just left with this hollow tube. Have y'all ever seen this stuff? Yes. That hollow tube in the marsh goes down into the mud and it reaches the roots. And the roots come off of that tube and oxygen can go right through the hole and get to all the roots that way. That's what that's why we have those hollow marsh reeds. It's their snorkels to get oxygen to the roots. And it's like the only plant that's evolved that. So it's the only plant that can grow in the marsh. There's actually a few other plants that have evolved it, but not many. So that's a, that's a very cool survival strategy. And that's one of the main problems of living in the marsh, trying to get oxygen to your roots. Roots are cells that have mitochondrions, and if you remember your biology, they have to have oxygen. Now, there are bacteria living in this marsh soil. And the bacteria need oxygen, too. Well, no, I'm sorry, the bacteria don't need oxygen. They, the, they, the bacteria have evolved to live without oxygen. They're called anaerobic bacteria. And they live without oxygen. And as a waste product, they make sulfur gas, <coughs> hydrogen sulfide. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. And it comes, but every once in a while, as the marsh uh, gets turned over, as the mud gets turned over, as the tides go in and out, some of this gas bubbles out, and uh, you can smell it. That's the smell of the marsh. It's sulfur smell. It doesn't smell very good. And some marshes produce more than others. If you have more bacteria than others, um, it is in large amounts. Hydrogen sulfide is poisonous. But the amounts we get out of our marsh, it won't kill you. It just smells, sometimes the marsh smells bad. So uh, that's kind of cool. They're called anaerobic bacteria. They can live without oxygen, but they produce that gas. We have different types of organisms that have different lifestyles based on salt. You have your urihaline organisms. They can live in a wide range of salinities. They have ways of coping with low salt levels and high salt levels. We call them urihaline. Oh, you got to memorize this. This is good multiple choice question stuff. Then there's your stenohaline. By the way, haline means salt. Your stenohaline organisms can only tolerate small ranges of salinity. And they have to go where the salinities are a little more stable. So they have to be in near the ocean or near the river and cannot go in these areas where there's a wide change. If you just stay near the ocean, you might get a small change in salinity, but not much. We call those stenohaline. So there's urihaline and then there's stenohaline um, organisms that are found in the estuaries. And then there's your osmoconformers. They um, change their body to the salinity. They try to match their body to the salinity. They're called osmoconformers. A lot of the a lot of the worms that are found in the marsh 
will just change their body. If, if it's high salinity, their body will be high salinity. If it's low salinity, their body will be low salinity. They conform to whatever the salinity is. Osmo conformers. And then there's your osmo regulators. Most of the fish are osmo regulators. They keep a constant salt level by excreting salts. Ten points if you could tell me what organ in a fish is responsible for excreting salts from their body. There's actually a couple of possible answers here. We already studied it. What is the fish organ responsible for excreting salts so that the fish can keep its salt level constant for a saltwater fish? Orange is incorrect. Where is she? What organ in a fish excretes salts? Here goes nothing. Yes, Peach is correct. Yes. Excuse me. We got it right. White is correct. Green is correct. Anyone else? The gills. The gills of a fish. It actually said it right there. You can read that. Yeah, the gills of a fish excrete salt from the water so that it can drink fresh water and get rid of extra salts. So we call them osmoregulators. You keep a constant salt level in your body and excrete salt or excrete water, depending on if you're a freshwater or saltwater fish. Um, take in salt, the gills are, are actually doing that. So these are a lot of words, special words, that will be on the next test. This is another word you have to know, productivity. Can you say productivity? Productivity. How productive an area is, is referring to the amount of photosynthesis that happens in the area. If an area has high productivity, that means there's a high amount of photosynthesis. So they can food. Making of food by plants. If the plants are making food, the plants are at the bottom of the food chain, then there's animals eating the plants. And you have a big food chain with a lot of different levels and a lot of different organisms living there. That's in a highly productive ecosystem. Do you know what the most productive ecosystem is? Yes. What? Go shout it out. Rainforest? Rainforest? Tropical rainforest. Coral reef. Great barrier Coral reef. reef? Is very highly productive. Rainforest is highly productive, Plains. and the and the estuary is highly productive. Estuary has about the same productivity as a rainforest. Can you believe that? Dang. Our marsh has just as much plant growth as a rainforest. And you think, how could that be? Rainforests have huge. Well, our marshes turn over very quickly. That's why you see all that marsh grass always wash up on the beach. They grow quickly, they die quickly, and then there's new growth. And, and you end up, if you measure it, it's just as much growth as a rainforest has. Yeah. Uh, this is not off topic, but is that asking about eels? Are they fish? Are they eels fish? are fish. Okay. Eels are fish, yeah. They look like snakes. Yes. But they're fish. They're, um, they, in the, and they uh, live in the, uh, they're born in the rivers what about those eels? They live in the rivers and then they go to the uh, ocean uh, as adults. Yeah. What about those eels with little hands? You know what I'm talking about? Eels with little hands. Yes, yes. I saw I saw a YouTube video. With, uh, mm -hmm. They found one in a tide pool. They're fish. They're fish. They're fish. Yeah. So what we have mostly here, and I'll show you next week when we go out there, we have mostly Spartina, which is cord grass. And it, it not only has evolved snorkels to get oxygen to its roots, it's also evolved a way to get rid of salt, extra salt from its body. It excretes it through little pores on the leaves, and you can actually see the salt in crystals outside of the plant. And so with these two evolutionary adaptations, it's about the only thing that can live in this marsh mud, and it just grows unchecked. There's nothing that, that can compete with it. And so that's most of the marsh grass here. Now there's a few other types of grasses which I'll show you when we go out there. 
But if you go south of here, down to Florida, or in the tropics like in uh, Central America, we, they don't have marsh grasses there. They have mangroves. The mangroves can outcompete the Spartina in tropical areas. And the Spartina tries to grow, but then the mangrove tree will grow up and shade out the Spartina, because the Spartina only grows so tall. And the place will be overtaken with mangroves. And so you have these huge mangrove forests in all the marshes in tropical areas. The mangrove does have a weakness, though. It cannot grow where, it's, where it freezes. If it freezes, it'll kill the mangroves. See, you never find mangroves in areas that freeze. Does it ever freeze here? Mm -hmm. It does yeah. sometimes. Not much, but it does sometimes. And that's why we have Spartina here. Mangroves can't grow here because it freezes. Now, if global warming continues and our climate gets warmer and warmer and it stops freezing here, that Spartina will get overtaken with mangroves. And, we'll have, and, and it'll look totally different around here. What do the mangroves look like? Those are mangrove trees. How are the mangroves seeds going to get here? What about They're the like a They float in the ocean. And you find them washed up on our beaches all the time. What about the stabby roots? But they, don't, they won't grow and survive. Aren't they like... Yeah, they have the stabby roots. See the stabby roots? Are Those are snorkels coming up from the roots. Just like the... Uh, just like the Spartina has, they have snorkels too. If that happened, wouldn't our uh, water become a lot clearer? Yeah, it would totally change our, our ecosystem. I mean, it would be so much different. Because different animals live in the mangrove forest, different insects. Get iguanas here. Um, yeah, you could have iguanas. Um, have look how thick the roots are there. Um, there's all kinds of differences in mangroves. So that might, we might end up with mangrove forests if global warming continues. This isn't something that happens overnight. It would probably take hundreds of years to establish a mangrove forest here. But, you know, you never know. Your great, great, great grandkids you might have a mangrove forest living here. You want to see video footage of, oh, are we out of time? We have four minutes. Today we're deep in the heart of a mangrove forest exploring some amazing trees that can survive in salt water. Have you ever noticed that, uh, you, you can watch that video, it's, it's in the, it's in the book. 